Hello, this is Janet Michael. In addition to hosting The Valley today each weekday at noon on the River 95.3, I also produce podcasts, and I'm excited to introduce you to a new podcast series in partnership with Lord Fairfax Community College. Having provided higher education and career training for the past half century, LFCC is tightly interwoven into the fabric of the Northern Shenandoah Valley and Piedmont regions. Join me every week for conversations with current and former students to hear their funny and inspiring stories as we learn about their journey to higher education, the role that LFCC has played, where they are now, and where they plan to go. We'll also talk to current and former professors about their experiences and best memories of LFCC over the past 50 years. Get every single episode as they're released on our website at theriver953.com under the podcast tab, or you can subscribe for free in Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, on Spotify, Amazon Music, wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for LFCC Stories. Hello and welcome to The Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. Happy Monday as you are listening to the show today. We are pre-recording today, but we are pre-recording in person. I am sitting inside the Alson H. Smith Jr. Agricultural Research and Extension Center, which is quite the mouthful. We're going to call it AREC, I think, for short moving forward. Do you think that's a good idea? That's what we call it. I am sitting here with Dr. Tony Wolf. He is the Director and Professor of Viticulture, and I've been practicing that all morning, so I didn't mess it up, Tony. So I'm really glad that I had a little bit of time to prep for this interview. So tell me about this building. What kind of work do you guys do here? We are one of the 11 AREC's, as you called it, the acronym for Agricultural Research and Extension Centers with the College of Agriculture and Life Science at Virginia Tech. The kind of work that we do here is really focused on the fruit industries of Virginia. Historically, the tree fruit industries, which include apples, peaches, cherries, other tree fruits. And then with my hire in the mid-80s, we introduced uh, wine grapes to the mix as well. So as as the name implies, we're a research and extension center. And we can talk a little bit about the research and talk a little bit about the extension and some of the other activities that we do here at this facility. We're located in Frederick County, obviously, uh, about seven miles southwest of Winchester. And I'd love to tell you a lot more about it. And you've got an open house that's coming up as people are listening to this. This weekend, it's coming up. The 14th of August, we do have an open house from 1 till 5 p.m. The public is invited to this. This is an annual open house. Last year, we had to do it virtually, but we're on for in-person. And I do have to say that the university has recently implemented a mask requirement again for public areas. So... Uh, If you wish to come, please do come. Bring a mask. We'll have some disposable masks, but uh, we'd love to show the public what we do and talk about what we do here. I've had so many conversations with Mark Sutphin and Master Gardeners that because you're part of Virginia Tech, their rules kind of become your rules. So what's going on on a larger scale sometimes impacts us here locally. It it does, and, and a point that I would try to make with your listeners is that We are a unit of Virginia Tech. People see us out here in Frederick County and they don't think of Blacksburg, you know, where Virginia Tech's main campus is located, but we uh, like to think of Virginia Tech as being spread throughout the Commonwealth. And uh, we are in very many ways, particularly with the extension part of what we do, each of the counties and municipalities has a unit, just like the one that Mark Sutphin works at. And so we do have uh, a statewide presence And these AREC's uh, are located throughout the state and support the commercial industries that those AREC's are designed to do. In our case, again, the fruit industry. So how did uh, Alson Smith get his name on the building? (laughs) (laughs) Well, for those who might not have known Alson Smith, he served in the General Assembly as a delegate from this region for 20 years, 1974 to 1994. And he was instrumental in getting the appropriations uh, for this new facility. We actually have a long history in this uh, area, that is Virginia Tech's uh, involvement in the fruit industry. It goes back, coincidentally, 100 years to 1921. Ah. We had a fruit research facility here in Frederick County. It grew and evolved over the years, and for a long time we were located on Route 11 near Kernstown and in a building that was built in the 40s. So Alson Smith was, for those of you who knew him, he was a very effective delegate and he was effective in getting most of the monies appropriated for this facility and on 
that, the university provided his namesake to this facility. So I think it's great. I'm just yeah. we, I'm just wondering what I got to do to get my name on a building. And so far, <laughs> it hasn't happened, but I'm still holding out hope. You gave me a quick tour before we sat down to have this conversation, and I met a few students. You have students that actually work here. We do. Maybe not in the traditional sense that your listeners would think of, but most of the students that we have here are graduate students, so they're working on either their master's degree or their Ph.D. They take courses on campus. They do some teaching while they're on campus, and then they, at some point in their term of of pursuing their degree, they move here and complete their research, which is either lab-based or field-based here. But in addition, we do have uh, undergraduate students that come and work for us sometimes during the summer, and we've even taken on, we would say, advanced high school uh, age kids uh, for summer employment. So we try to get people interested in agricultural research and the type of research that we're doing at an early age. So when we talk about students, I like to think of the whole range of Mm -hmm. students. We've even had governor school uh, classes come out, for example, do tours with us. So we're, we're open to all of those things, and over the years, that's been part of our outreach program. So when you say research, what kinds of things are you researching? Well, our research is really aimed at the, again, problems that confront the industries that we're working with. So if we think about the tree fruit industry or the wine grape industries, we have both biological problems and what we call abiotic problems, things that you might think of as changes in climate that are causing problems with more severe weather, let's, let's say a less predictable weather. We're having more problems with spring frost, for example. So our research is really aimed at, at overcoming or at least mitigating some of those challenges. I think we're all aware of some of the problems with invasive pests. You, mm-hmm. Your shows have covered spotted lanternfly recently. Prior to that, brown marmorated stink bug was a huge issue. We're always going to have invasive pests. We'll get rid of some <laughs> uh, or they'll become less of a problem only to see others come on the scene. So in the case of brown marmorated stink bug, for example, we have an entomologist here who really devoted the last 10 years, much of the last 10 years, of his research program, working with others at USDA and also within Virginia Tech and other land-grant institutions to try to come up with tools and strategies to to help mitigate that problem. So he has a student now working on a a parasitoid of uh, brown marmorated stink bug. This is a small um, insect, a wasp insect, very small that lays an egg in the eggs of the brown marmorated stink bug. So it's a, it's a biological control mechanism, but they're not widely, these little parasitic wasps are not widely distributed out through Virginia. So that's what his research is really aimed at trying to do is to more broadly distribute them f- through Virginia so that we have this, this biological control agent so we don't have to be out spraying all the time for them. For and sure. how do you decide what it is you're well, gonna great, research? Yeah, great question. We don't just come up with these ideas on our own. We survey the industry. I can't call you up and say, hey, Tony, I need you to check this out for me, and you'll start a whole project on it. I mean, we do have our own ideas about things, but we have to do research that's relevant to the industry, you know, because it really comes down to what will the industry support and what will the sponsors that support our research fund. So we have to be relevant in that regard. And so the, the way we determine that really is to survey industries, whether it's the wine grape industry, whether it's the tree fruit industry, we do surveys on a regular basis. What are the problems that you're dealing with? We take a look at those and say, okay, what do we have the resources to do here at this particular AREC? I mean, most of us are either horticulturists or in my case, a viticulturist, entomologist. We're not necessarily marketing specialists. That's a big issue. We're not labor specialists, so we focus on the toolboxes in our own uh, resources to to work on. And that makes sense, too, because you're not going to want to pick a project that would have very little impact if you found a solution or something for it. You're going to want to make sure it's relevant to this community and has some sort of positive impact. Sure. At least we don't want to spend a lot of resources on doing something if we're not going to have impact. So speaking of resources, how does your funding work? Well, we're supported by state and federal sources of funding through the experiment station at Virginia Tech. We do have operating dollars that flow to the facility here. They help pay salaries uh, for our regular staff and faculty. They help pay what we call overhead. The lights above us here are the overhead. But beyond that, those sources of funding 
aren't increasing. If anything, they're going down. So the the burden of, of funding what we do has been in, increasingly placed on us, and the faculty respond to that by going out and writing grant proposals, getting funding to do the research through that way. Now, we can go to commodity-based groups. There's the Virginia Apple Research Program. There's the Virginia Wine Board. These fund some of the projects that we do, and, and they've been very consistent and very dependable sources of funding over the years. There are other sources of state funding that we can pursue. F through VDACs, we, we can uh, get, get funding if we write successful grant proposals. And then there's also federal grant proposals that we're all involved in. So these are multi-state typically. It, and to make a point with that is the, the problems that we research here are not necessarily limited to Virginia. They have regional impact, and in some cases they have national impact, if not global impact. So there, there are sources of money beyond Virginia borders that can be brought back here to Virginia and support us. It's where that marketing you mentioned a minute ago, marketing gets a little bit more important when it comes to the financial end of it sometimes. Yeah, the more people yeah. that know what you do and how well you do it here, the well, easier it is sometimes yeah. to ask for that money and then get the yeah, approval for yeah. it. So we have to market ourselves in that <laughs> regard. You're, you're right. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick break. We've talked a bit about research. Can we talk a little bit about extension in the sure. next segment? And then I want to talk a little bit, too, about the details for the open house this weekend. Okay. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation. We are pre-recording today with Dr. Tony Wolf. He is the director and professor of viticulture at the Alson H. Smith Jr. Agricultural Research and Extension Center. We are in person pre-recording today. We'll be back to continue our conversation in just a couple of minutes. Got a financial decision to make or a goal to reach, but you don't know where to start? You've come to the right place. Introducing Quick Money Chats with the Northern Shenandoah Valley Financial Education Program. Visit tinyurl.com backslash quickmoneychat to schedule a virtual chat with a staff member or trained volunteer. We won't tell you what to do, but we will give you the tools you need to choose wisely. And because Virginia Cooperative Extension is part of Virginia Tech and Virginia State, your land-grant universities, you can be sure that our information is credible and trustworthy. And you'll know that we aren't trying to sell you something. Maybe you want to improve your credit score or reduce your banking overdraft fees, or even figure out if you can afford to buy that car. Sorting through tons of information on the internet can be overwhelming, and sometimes it can be hard to know who to trust. Schedule a quick funny chat and get the information you need to take action. Go to tinyurl.com backslash quick money chat and get financial education personalized for you. Welcome back to the Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. Happy Monday. As you are listening to the show today, we have pre-recorded our conversation. We are chatting today with Dr. Tony Wolf. He is the Director and Professor of Viticulture at the Alson Smith Agricultural Research and Extension Center located in Frederick County. We are recording in person. They've got an open house coming up this weekend. We're going to get more details for that in a, in a second. But Tony, we were talking in the first segment a lot about the different types of research that you do, but your name also includes extension. Extension Center. We talked a bit about Mark Sutphin, also who's a regular guest. How does the Extension play a role here in what you guys do? For those who really aren't familiar with Extension, I should start out by saying that the faculty here at the AREC are what we call specialists within the university system. So we're specialized. In my case, I'm specialized with the science of grape growing, viticulture. We have entomologists here that specialize in tree fruit, entomological problems, bug problems, if you will, or arthropod pro problems. Extension goes beyond that, though. As you're well aware, we have extension units at the local level that have a much broader uh, mandate in terms of what they cover. So extension agents like Mark Sutphin cover a number of different things. We work very closely with extension agents in delivering our, our program. Extension is really all about education mm -hmm. and, and disseminating research knowledge whether it's generated by us or other, other uh, people, is getting that information and knowledge into the end user's hands. So we do that in a number of ways. Some are face-to-face -face type meetings that we're able to hold, certainly in the pre-COVID period. <laughs> and hopefully in the future, we have a facility here that has a nice conference room. We do a lot of meetings here that give that information or provide that information directly to our producers. So the type of information will vary throughout the year depending on the, the, the season. The other means that we have of distributing the information is through web-based resources 
resources. Some of these are blogs that are used by our specialists. Uh, we have print resources that are available. And we have good old-fashioned emails and <laughs> telephones that sometimes come into play as well. The people that we work with, whether they be in the tree fruit industry or the wine grape industry, know that if they need to, they can pick up the phone and get in touch with us. For newer producers, people that are really just exploring the industry, we really do encourage them to work through their local extension office. We have, even though we're located in Frederick County, we have statewide application, if you will. We have, we have responsibility throughout the state, so we would entertain visitors if need be f- that, that might come in that are established growers have a problem. They can bring that problem here to us. Typically, though, we try to steer this, those kind of uh, things through the extension office because we have better resources on campus, for example, at the plant disease clinic or at the insect identification lab. I mean, extension, again, is really about delivering that information, and, and we have a wide range of, of how we do that. And Mark has done a lot of shows with me. We've talked about a lot of different topics. I don't know that he and I have ever had the conversation on air. His main gig at the extension office is dealing with the commercial commercial fruit does. growers and the plants and the trees and, and that sort of thing. We talk about so many other things. We don't often yeah. talk about that, but I would guess that there are you being here is a huge benefit, not just to Mark as a resource, but to the apple orchards and Mm -hmm. the peach orchards and all of the people that are farmers here in this area. We look to Mark for a lot of the assistance that he provides us. He's somewhat unique in extension in that he's focused in commercial horticulture. There are other ag and natural resource agents. Mark is is in that area of of extension, but there are others that maybe cover animal science, Mm -hmm. other issues that we as an AREC don't have really any any responsibilities for. We're strictly in commercial horticulture or tree fruit and wine grape horticulture, as is Mark. So it really does come in handy. It does. It's a two-way street. (laughs) You know, we we look to Mark for help and, and he looks to us also for help. He's quite involved, heavily involved in setting up some of the educational programs that we do here, particularly with the tree fruit. Later this week on Friday, I'm having a conversation. It'll air later this week on Friday with Eddie Richard from Richard's Fruit Market. He has a a peach festival coming up this weekend. He's going to hear this conversation and give me grief because he probably had a question that he probably (laughs) wished I would have known that I could have asked you while I was here. (laughs) Do you have some of the local orchardists that reach out to you directly or do they typically go through Mark? Some will reach out to us directly if they have a problem. Our horticulturist, for example, has research in the area of crop load management of apples that's a perennial problem and it's not one that there's always an easy answer for because it the weather impacts the degree of thinning that might be achieved apple producers often have to use spinners because apple trees many of the varieties have a biennial bearing habit Mm -hmm. so they need to be able to thin the trees but they need to be able to do it in a predictable manner if you over thin you're taking away your revenue your crop potentially yield so we have some producers that might approach dr sharif for example, directly on a, on a question, particularly if it's something, okay, with the weather coming up in the next two or three days, what would you do? But there again, we have a lot of meetings at that time of the year, which is in the spring. So many of those producers are coming here and getting the information as a group rather than individually. A couple of weeks ago, I went on a Faces of Tourism in Shenandoah County and we visited Woodbine. Mm -hmm. And she talked about some of their apple trees and how far apart they have to be planted and all of these different things. I had no idea that there was so much science behind apple orchards. And there really, really is. There is, there is. And uh, things change. I mean, things like some of the plant growth regulators that are being used for apple thinning those those change somewhat over the years the biological aspects of it the pest management aspects that are probably the most dynamic though because again uh, there are changes in the the spectrum of insects for example or mice that may affect a, an orchard from year to year so the open house that's this weekend is open to the public are you normally not open to the public is this kind of a big deal that you do this once a year We don't encourage people just dropping by to see what we're doing. We're not necessarily closed. We don't keep the doors locked. Some facilities, USDA, for example, will do that. We're not really geared to handling walk-ins, so we don't want to disappoint people. We're very busy here with doing things out in the field or in labs or we're actually you know maybe out on the road and we don't want people coming by and being disappointed that there's not somebody here that they can talk to. So having said that, and to answer your question, yes, the public open house 
is one event that we do per year where we really encourage people to come by and get a, a broad picture of what we do and actually hear the faculty and students talk about the research that they do and what impact that has. So what will that day look like? What can people expect when they come out? Well, we'll see what the weather provides. <laughs> well, there is I, that. I, I think if, we, if we're looking at the current weather and looking ahead, it's supposed to be dry. So we will have uh, displays and exhibits in the conference room here. It's sort of a staging area for two wagon tours that we will do, one probably around 1.30 and another at about 3.30. These will take about an hour apiece. It's going to be a, a ride out on the farm. We have about a 120-acre farm, but the idea is to get people as a group out, and we will go from point to point and at each point have a faculty member or a student talking about some of the research that they're doing at that point. You'll see orchards, you'll see some novel aspects of plant management, uh, some protected culture systems. And, Things and, and, that probably the average person knows this building is here and thinks they probably yeah. might know what it is you do, but they're going to be shocked when they take that tour and learn well, all of these other things. Well, maybe, I don't know if I'd use the word shock, <laughs> but maybe they'll learn something from it. If, you've, if a person has been to a pick-your-own operation, they've seen orchards, it's going to look very similar to that, but you'll hear a lot more detail about the research that we have going in to support that production. And do people have to register or anything nope. for the open house? Just no. show up? What are the times again? It uh, starts at 1 o'clock and it ends at five o'clock. So it's a revolving door of sorts. You don't have to be here the whole time. Come, uh, listen to us where we don't really have indoor presentations lined up other than some exhibits, which are typically gonna be one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, it'll, it'll be an opportunity to just uh, rub elbows with us and, and hear what we're doing. So you don't have to stay the whole time, but anytime during that window. And what is the address here again? It's 595 Laurel Grove Road in Winchester, 22602. And people can Google it. That's uh, just to make sure that I remembered where I was coming to. I did that. It was very easy to find. <laughs> yes. If, if you want, just uh, you can find us on the web. If you Google or use the search browser, you'll under the Alson H. Smith Agricultural Research and Extension Center, Virginia Tech. And just to reiterate one more time, masks will be required yes. because of current COVID circumstances. Yes. Thanks for reminding me. And that is something that is really just going into effect now, but the university is requiring all public areas indoors. For outdoors, we don't have to have masks, but indoors in public areas, we will require a mask. If you don't have one when you're here, not everybody will be hearing this message. We'll have some disposable masks. Just in case. In case. Well, Tony, thank you for taking some time to kind of give me the quick tour and uh, fill me in on all of the cool stuff that you guys are doing here. I think it's fascinating. Thank you, Janet. I appreciate it. I will be back tomorrow. It is Tourism Tuesday. I am going to have a conversation with Vicki Ruckman about a wine festival that's coming up. Ironically enough, sitting here with a viticulturist, we're talking about wine tomorrow. So meet me back here just a few minutes after noon, and I will have that conversation ready to go for you.